Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one, action. Assume nothing. Rash, bald face, blasphemy. Question everything. I find it extremely hard to imagine. Open your eyes. It is quite all right to be an atheist. The fastest growing group of people in the country has been measured as being those who have no belief or who are atheists. You don't have to be apologetic or quiet about it. Challenge the opposition. You see religion on a hundred fronts losing the argument. And start thinking. This is The Thinking Atheist Worldwide. Our broadcast tonight brought to you by Audible.com with more than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. You can stream them online or download them. And a free audiobook of your choice awaits you with your 30-day trial at audiblepodcast.com slash Thinking Atheist. That's audiblepodcast.com slash Thinking Atheist. I'm going to be in Springfield, Missouri, coming up on Saturday, speaking to a free thought group and anybody in the area who wants to come out. And I hope I get a chance to meet you. It starts around 1, I think 1.15, 1.30 or so. Somebody else is using the, the venue until 1. And then after that, we're going to jump in and have a couple hours of heathenry and shenanigans. It's going to be a great time. Springfield, Missouri. After that, it's Free Flow, Florida Free Thought, coming up early November. I'll be in Tampa shortly after that. All of these events are listed at thethinkingatheist.com slash events. Coming up in the next few weeks, we're going to talk next week about the Jesus story. I've got a series of videos coming out called Mystery Faith, featuring Dr. Richard Carrier and David Fitzgerald. I'm going to release the audio of those conversations in podcast form, because I just thought they would make great radio. Then we're well into the month of October. We're talking Halloween, which means it's time to talk about what scares us and ghost stories. The annual tradition will air on the 20th of October. Lots of good stuff coming up. I love this time of year, and not just because everything is pumpkin, pumpkin spice, Pumpkin flavored, pumpkin whatever. So a lot of good reasons to enjoy the month of October. Before we get into the meat of tonight's broadcast, you've heard me mention my own books are available on audible.com. Deconverted and Sacred Cows, well received overall in audio form. Great fun for me to produce and hopefully great fun to listen to. Well, a great many authors and activists in the free thought movement have their books available in audio form as well. Jerry Coyne's latest book is called Faith Versus Fact. Dan Barker's Life Driven Purpose, Richard Carrier's On the Historicity of Jesus, Greta Christina's Coming Out Atheist, Peter Bogosian's A Manual for Creating Atheist, Penn Gillette's Every Day is an Atheist Holiday, and a lot more. If you enjoy listening to books as well as reading them, Audible has an offer where your first audiobook is free with a 30 day trial as an Audible listener. You can access them wherever you want smartphone, computer, Kindle, MP3 player. You listen when you drive, while you work, when you're on the treadmill, whatever. And a library of over 180,000 audio choices. So support this show. Sign up for your free trial tonight. Log on to audiblepodcast.com slash thinking atheist. That's audiblepodcast.com slash thinking atheist. I've got three special guests joining me for kind of a panel tonight as we talk about the challenges and the opportunities facing the ex-Muslim. I've got Mohammed Syed, who I just interviewed on video not long ago and released that video to YouTube. He's the executive director of the ex-Muslims of North America. Mohammed joins us tonight. Great to have you. Seth, great to be here. I've got Sarah Hader. She's director of development for the ex-Muslims of North America. Sarah, do I have you on the line? Absolutely. Great to be here, Seth. And I've got Armin Navabi. He is the founder of Atheist Republic at atheistrepublic.com and also author of the book, Why There Is No God, which you can find now, believe it or not, at audible.com. Armin, thanks so much for being a part of the broadcast this evening. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me. I'll start with you, Armin. You are an ex-Muslim. You were once a devout Muslim. What's your backstory? Um, yeah, I, uh, I was born in Iran. Um, I was raised in a fairly liberal family, uh, so they weren't 
I mean, they called themselves Muslims, but they didn't practice Islam. Uh, I became a very religious during uh, my teen years. Um, for a short while, it didn't last more than a year. I took Islam much more seriously around age 15, which scared the hell out of my parents. But eventually, because I took Islam more seriously and I studied Islam more closely, that eventually turned me into an atheist. How about you, Sarah? Were you a devout, do I say Islamist or Muslim? And you want to draw a distinction there? Uh, I think Muslim is fine, at least for our conversation. Okay. Uh, I would say that I was never... I was never especially devout. Uh, there was a period where I began to have a, a scholarly interest in Islam, um, especially, I mean, around the time I think what I call myself as, you know, growing up and becoming a thinking person, you know, the time in your mid-teens where you start to think about your opinions and maybe why you hold them. Um, and especially in my in my case, I was I had a few atheist friends, I had many Christian friends, so as we started talking about things like politics, things like religion, I began to understand that maybe I don't know so much about my own faith. So I think at that point, and this was about in high school, um, at that point I started looking into my faith deeper than I ever had before. And one thing that I do like to point out, I always point this out because I think it's really relevant, um, part of my leaving Islam and leaving the faith was my encounter with atheists and even b belligerent atheists, people who were offensive to me at, at the time anyway. But it was part of uh, being offended, part of that process where I was so offended that I had to defend my faith that maybe pushed me to look into it deeper and and um, with more thoroughness than I would, would have otherwise. So maybe a little bit of my deconversion can be credited to that as well. But it's been a while now, and um, slowly but surely I'm convincing my family as well. So I, I guess there's some hope there. What's the story on mom and dad? Are they totally freaked out? You're a pretty public non-believer. Right. At first, uh, I mean, even still, I would say they're, they're worried about my safety. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been an atheist, so they're no longer surprised by, by you know, the, the blasphemy that I regularly spout. And I'm not in the habit of, ke of keeping my opinions quiet uh, when it comes time to meeting with the family. I think that happened, that's the experience of a lot of people that are ex-Muslim or even atheists, where when they're around religious family out of, their, out of respect for them um, or just the fear of not wanting to start a family feud, they keep their opinions to themselves, but I'm, I'm not like that. I'm very outspoken about it. So at this point, the atheism itself doesn't scare them, but this since in the last three years since I've been working with ex-Muslims in North America, uh, I think they're worried about my safety more than anything else. And, I mean, I can't say that, that they have no reason to feel that way, but other than that, they've come to accept it. My, my father, I think in the past year, decided that, that it was time that, that he was going to call himself an atheist as well. And I've been working on him for, for, for some time, and he's been researching and looking into things himself. And I'm so happy that, that now he's even open about it with my, the rest of my family. So that's wonderful. Mohammed Sayed, you once believed and you decided you were going to do a better job of defending your faith. Is that how I'm to understand it? You thought, oh, I'm going to become a better apologist for Islam, right? <laughs> well, from my perspective, it wasn't an apology because it was, quote unquote, the truth. So um, what happened with me was a few friends um, became very conservative and I wanted to convince them that their perspective on Islam was wrong. So I spent about a year going through religious texts and researching it. And over time, it, there are so many holes that you have to fill in to continue to believe that you realize that you are actually lying to yourself in order to try to hold on to the, your faith. And uh, there was a moment where I was thinking to myself that, why am I doing this when I know this is not true? And that was hardly it. Where were you living at the time? Um, I was in the U.S. Um, so... I had friends uh, from Pakistan that were also in the that had come to the U.S. Um, we did went to grad school, and um, one of them the, got super conservative and moved back to Pakistan. He actually enrolled in the madrasa and stayed there. And I went back to Pakistan and I visited him and I talked to him and I was shocked and horrified. 
So over the next few months, I was reading and researching and trying to figure it out. Sarah, you said something, and someone in the chat room just noticed it. You said that it was the ridicule of religion that actually helped to push you towards skepticism in your own life. I'm, I'm perhaps putting words in your own mouth. Is that an accurate way to sort of summarize what you just said? The fact that mockery of religion sort of pushed you toward that end, or no? It, it was definitely a part of the process in the sense that I think when there are some people that are very comfortable in their religion, you need a little bit of that, that shock. You need somebody in front of you who, who refuses to hold sacred what you hold sacred. And I think that sometimes almost that disrespect is what, what will make some people look twice, or in my case, um, it's not, it's not, I think that, that it made me doubt my faith. It's that it made me want to defend it because I felt for the first time that it was being disrespected and that I was, I was to be part of, of the defense of religion. And in my case, because I was trying to look for ways to defend Islam, however I could, I, I researched, uh, the, the claims that were, that were given to me. A lot of them were Quranic verses, which I thought, well, they can be explained in context and I just have to find the context. And the fact of the matter was that when I did find the context, it was sometimes worse than, than it, it seemed just at the face of it. Um, Beyond that, there were uh, questions about uh, something called scientific miracles of the Quran, uh, and this is something a lot of Muslims believe, which is that there are there are miracles of, of these predictions that scientists have only just found out about the world that that, that Islam uh, predicted long time ago, and I believed that until it was sort of pointed out to me that I was this is a little ridiculous. You have to prove this to me. And so when I started looking into it and looking at the science itself, I thought this, of course, this makes no sense. Armin, she's talking about mockery, but you know, in the wake of Charlie Hebdo and all of these other nasty headlines, we see mockery is not welcome when it comes to Islam. I mean, we see protest in other religious faiths, but it seems with Islam, the stakes are much higher. Is that perception accurate? Uh, yeah, I think what you see, it's the loudest uh, people, but there's a lot of people on the side that are taking notes and haven't considered a lot of these arguments until it became headline news or until so there's a lot of social media share. So what we see usually, uh, with what is the most visible is the quick reaction and, and uh, the, the reaction that a lot of people take. But the people that do, and, and a lot of Muslims or skeptics, that see both sides of these arguments raising these points. I think this back and forth helps them try to come up with where, where they stand on this or what they think about these issues. But they are usually not the loudest, especially when it comes to Islam, because a lot of them fear the backlash. So I do think that we are changing minds, even, even when it comes to stuff that might be offensive or mockery. I mean, comedy and mocking ideas has, has always been a tool of, uh, for bringing attention to different ideas. It's not, it's just not, not Islam. I mean, within politics, within other ideologies, people have been used mockery as a way to bring attention to many different issues. So I don't know why it should be different for Islam. My perspective is that it's not that there is something special about Islam in the sense of and something special about the scriptural text that makes blasphemy uh, something that's more distasteful to Muslims. I just think they haven't been exposed to it before. Uh, this is the first time that, I mean, Christians have, this has been happening to Christians for a long time. They've been facing ridicule. They've been facing mockery. And uh, that changed uh, their, their sort of comfort level with this, with this whole thing. And they don't feel that they have some right to not be offended in the way that Christians, or in the way that Muslims do. So I'm going to give you a perception of mine, and you tell me if I'm crazy, okay? But from time to time, most of the interactions I have on my pages have to do with the religion of my region and my home state, my home country. It's mostly Christianity. We don't do a whole lot on Islam. And yet when I have a defender of Islam come by, usually after I've posted something like Muhammad's video or something, right? Muhammad Sayed's interview that posted last week. There will be someone who comes by and they speak in these weird bumper stickers. They're not communicating in a thoughtful way. It is just Allah is great. Islam is the way. You know, these one sentence sound biteable 
regurgitations of <laughs> of a single thought. So, I mean, is that is that normal? Is it part of a language barrier? Do you see instances of this? Um, it's normal because they haven't deeply thought about these issues. So why is freedom to offend necessary? Why is everybody's definition of sacred different? Why should I be tolerant? Why should I be intolerant? What does blasphemy actually mean? Um, there is no deep conversation, deep understanding of these issues in Muslim countries because they've never encountered them. They've always been able to assert their dominance and shut down any conversation. Therefore, the soundbite is, of course, this is wrong, or Islam is the truth, and simple statements like that, because there are no complex thoughts generally associated with it. I think you and I had this conversation when we were speaking in uh, Harrisburg, that there were some echoes of this in many religious cultures. Christianity, people who have no idea what's in their Bible, but they just know it's true. They have no idea where the origins of the Christ story came from, but they know that Jesus is real, those types of things. Is it even more so, do you think, in many Islamic areas and in the Islamic faith in general? Yes, uh, in the sense that a lot of cultures are very insular. In Pakistan, I had never encountered anybody else from any other religion. It was everybody is Muslim. So you don't have any exposure to anything that goes contrary to your beliefs. And you have nothing that actually pushes you to think. Um, in America or in, in other countries where you look into secularism, you look into philosophy, you look into why we think what we think, whatever it is, uh, the conversation is usually very different. At the very least, even if you aren't somebody who's looking into philosophy all the time or reading, you are at the very, you, you know, you know, maybe somebody who's a Jew or somebody who's a different kind of, you know, Christian than you, uh, you are exposed to different faiths in a way that you really aren't in most parts of, of the Muslim world. Even, you know, Shia Muslims and Sunni Muslims sort of stay to, to their own and there's, you know, whole little villages or, or parts of town that, that only have a certain kind of religion. So you're just not exposed to this pluralism, which I think in itself plants a seed of doubt. One thing that uh, is changing that is obviously social media, but, and a lot of people point that out, that uh, it's, it's, it's becoming a lot easier for uh, Muslims to seek out uh, alternative information. But on the other hand, it it's also works against us because, um, you know, a lot of people point out that this is the age of information but it's true that it's also the age of misinformation. There's a lot of noise out there on the internet, and it's really hard for a lot of people to uh, be able to figure out what's true and what's not. And a lot of these Muslim, uh, Islamic organizations are actually doing a much better job than us when it comes to spreading their ideas um, on social media. A lot of them are backed by Saudi money or other funds and if you look at their social media strategies, they are very, very effective and they know exactly what they're doing. And um, it's becoming, you know, for us, it's becoming very difficult to break through all that noise, especially when every Muslim, when they see these posts, they feel like they have to share it. So they just try to, dr if, they, if, they, if they can't silence us, they just try to drown us up. And we need to do a better job at reaching out to people. Talking here with Mohammed Syed and Sarah Hader of the ex-Muslims of North America, and Armin Navabi of Atheist Republic. I want to camp out on Islam for just a little bit and further address some of these issues before we get into the ex-Muslim, okay? And I know all of you are. As we sit here tonight, an international campaign is underway to stop the Saudi Arabian government from beheading and crucifying Ali al-Namir, a dissident who engaged in pro-democracy demonstrations three years ago. He was 17 at the time. He allegedly confessed to his treason, quite possibly under the conditions of torture, and he stands to be one of the next execution victims in a nation that has one of the highest execution rates in the world. 134 people so far this year, many by public Beheading. For those keeping score, that's one execution every two days. Many of the executed being children under the age of 18 and the disabled also. There was a recent report by Amnesty International released last month. According to them, 2,208 people have been executed in Saudi Arabia since January of 1985. Over 2,000. About a quarter of those were for drug-related offenses. Other crimes worthy of death include adultery, sorcery, and of course, 
apostasy. I'm reminded of a chilling video that's been circulating out there about the Burmese woman accused of abusing and killing her stepdaughter. Sharia court found her guilty and right there on the street, right there in Mecca, four guards held her down as she screamed for mercy. She's screaming, I did not kill. I did not kill. And a cloaked man with a sword brought down the blade upon her and beheaded her. Let's talk about Saudi Arabia. Right, the nation that sentenced Raif Badawi, the political blogger, to a thousand lashings, ten years in prison. What is the story with a nation that was just recently chosen to lead a United Nations Human Rights Council? Anyone want to comment on any of this? Yeah, it's, it's amazing with that when ISIS does beheadings, it gets so much attention on the news. But when Saudi Arabia does it, it doesn't get as much attention it's not even more because it's been done legally, you know, and, and, and then when you put and you, you try so much to get the hu- human rights and the UN to pay attention to this issue. And then all of a sudden you see they put them at the head of the human rights in the UN. So it's just like such a such a disappointment. It's basically the same as putting uh, equivalent to putting the al-Baghdadi, uh, the head of ISIS at the head of the UN, they, you know, it's, it's just, I, I don't know, it's ridiculous. Some people point out that maybe by putting them on the panel, they might try, they're trying to force them into looking into their human rights record. Some people say that this is just a rotational thing, so it would, it would have to happen anyways. But I think it would be a much bigger statement if they just denied that position to them to make that that would be a much more powerful, uh, I mean, a lot of people think that Saudi Arabia doesn't care it's about its international image, but it does. It has changed its action before based on the scrutiny that it got from the international community. So, so, so such an action from the UN would have clearly been noted by the Saudi government, which is a shame that they didn't do that. I think I had read that the Saudi Supreme Court had been reviewing or reconsidering their Raif Badawi case after public outrage planted wide, it's possible that the outcry may have caused them to at least pause before the next round of lashings. I don't know if that has any merit. Mohammed or Sarah, you want to weigh in on Saudi Arabia? Um, they did uh, pause the lashing as a result of that, but their policy hasn't really changed. Um, there was an appeal that was denied. I know about that. I don't know if it's being reconsidered or not. The issue with Saudi Arabia is it's more about geopolitics in the sense of America is dependent upon them for oil and therefore isn't willing to stand up to them. About the reason that it happens, it's um, the same thing you would see in any medieval Christian country 500 years ago. It's theocracy, plain, pure, and simple. Let the Lord sort out who is guilty and who is not guilty. It doesn't really matter to that extent. Why beheading? Is it religiously motivated? Is there some sort of a, a thing in Islam or in radical Islamism about beheading someone? Or is it a, a cultural? Or why this method of public execution? Anybody know? Um, from what I understand, it's historical in the sense of Muhammad's era, capital punishment, beheading, the cutting of hands was the way it was done. Again, this is the 6th, 7th century. And since Muhammad's example is the perfect example, it's incumbent upon Muslims to follow that. Not all Muslims do. Most Muslim countries don't do it because of the extremeness of it. But Saudi Arabia is trying to, similar to ISIS, I would say, be as close to Muhammad's example as they can, and therefore they follow it much more closely than others do. So if you say in Saudi Arabia or several other Islamic countries, I am an apostate, I no longer believe. Um, it varies uh, country to country. Um, so in Saudi Arabia, you would be killed, imprisoned, or killed, depending upon the, the exact charge. In various other countries, um, some countries have blasphemy laws where you would be killed. At least 13 of them do. In a, in a lot of countries, though, it doesn't come to that. You, public lynchings uh, and uh, being attacked by mobs is far more prevalent. In Pakistan, there have been very few actual executions for apostasy or blasphemy, but most people have been killed before they were even arrested. How are women treated in Saudi Arabia or similar environments? It really depends on the country. I mean, uh, a lot of people treat the whole Middle East as as if it's the same, um, you know, it's Islamic, all, not just the Middle East, but all Islamic countries as if it's the same thing. But it really varies from country to country. If you go from Saudi Arabia to Lebanon, you're going to get, in Lebanon, you're going to get a lot more liberal if you go to Indonesia, you're going to see a little bit more equal rights for women, but still not quite equal. Um, if you go to Iran, um, you see that it's only 
one of the few other countries that has hijab mandatory, but still women are very involved in important jobs, but they still don't have, they need permission from their husbands to travel, which, you know, a lot of people find it strange if it's, if, it, if they all claim to be Islamic, then why are they all so different? But they also do have a lot of fundamental uh, practices that are very much the same. And some people that try to say that this is not Islamic, they try to point to the difference of policies between these countries and they say if it was all Islamic, then why are they so different? But the fact is that governments are, these governments are very, being very practical. It is Islamic where they pick and choose based on what benefits them the most and what helps them stay in power. But at the end of the day, whatever policies they choose, they use the same argument with regards to the fact that this is based on Islam and it's mandated by God. And that's why it's legitimate. And that's why it's it's supposed to be, uh, you know, they, they, they claim authority because for that based on that reasoning. And we're often ham handed when we talk about Islam and Muslims in generalities, because it is so sort of region specific, right? Every Islamic or Muslim culture has its own flavor, its own shades, and they have to be dealt with individually. Would that be accurate, Sarah? To some extent, yeah. But that is changing as everyone is becoming, and I I read this um, specifically per Wes Hood Boy. He is a Pakistani nuclear physicist. And he's talked about this a little bit, where he thinks that it is the rise of literacy that has changed um, how we interpret the scriptures, um, the Muslim world overall, in the sense that more and more people are able to read exactly what the scriptures say. So they don't have to rely on what um, a local imam says or, you know, anybody else says about what Islam is or what, what is prescribed. They can read it. They can read it directly. And what that means is that we are... That there are a lot of people now who are, who can take the religion literally, because they can see with their own eyes and, and read themselves at what what they have to do um, in order to be a good Muslim. And sort of to backtrack a little bit on what you were talking about women's rights, um, one thing I wanted to add to what Armin said uh, was that it's similar. I think this is similar to Christianity in that Islam is a gendered religion. Uh, which is to say that the roles of women and the roles of men are completely different. What gets a woman uh, into heaven is a, com- is a different set of criteria than what gets a man into heaven. Um, and what awaits you there in heaven, and I think a lot of people have talked about this before, what awaits you in heaven is different depending on whether or not you're a man or a woman. If you're a man, you can expect your uh, 70 virgins if you're a martyr. If you're a woman and you're a good Muslim and you and you pass away, you if you are good, again, you, you get your husband in, in heaven. Along with his 70 virgins. That yeah, and he, and, he, and he may have his 70 virgins along with you. Um, but, but you have to join the virgins in paradise? Hey, wait a minute. You know, I imagine it would be hard to compete for his attention, so I don't know how much of a reward that is. Um, but in, in my, my point being is that it is a gendered religion from beginning to end. So we can't be surprised that that in turn relates to uh, how people uh, treat men and women here on earth today and how we treat them before the law. But Sarah, I was doing a podcast a few years ago called Islam and Women, and I remember doing some research and browsing various websites, and I was struck by the number of pro-woman, quote-unquote pro-woman Islamic websites, sort of selling the message that Islam celebrates women. The hijab is actually because the woman is precious and must be protected and extolled, and Islam loves women. And it almost seemed like a like a marketing campaign to try to counter many of the the charges that radical Islamists especially mistreat women. Do you want to speak to Islam and women from your own perspective? I think what you talked about when you say that there's a it's a part of a marketing campaign, I think that's exactly true. In the sense that from my experience, uh, I was taught from a very early age that Islam is wonderful to women and Islam is the best religion for women and Islam gave rights women never had before at the time. Um, or Islam gave, gave rights that other religions have never given women. And I grew up thinking that Islam was a pro-woman religion and that it was an empowering religion. And what you talked about, what you mentioned just now, Seth, that the covering is considered um, an honorable thing. It's, it's, it's a gift given to you. 
and it makes you more precious. And you're like, I've heard metaphors that you're like a diamond and, and like anyone would want to hide his jewels. They wouldn't want to show them off because then thieves would take them in the same way. You know, somebody who loves you will want to keep you hidden and safe from the world. Um, and these sort of metaphors were very common. And I was actually quite shocked when I first looked into the verses, especially the one that talks about um, how you can, you know, beat a, your wife lightly as part of a disciplining uh, procedure. And it, this was shocking to me. It really was. And I agree with you that it's a part, I think, it, I think it's a part of um, stopping these questions before they ever come up. But is the hijab an attempt to, and I guess probably again varies from culture to culture, but is it an attempt to make a woman faceless, subservient, the anonymous, voiceless other, or is it something else? And how do women themselves feel about being covered head to toe? I mean, the way that a particular woman would feel, I think, depends on the woman herself. Um, I would agree with what you said, that it is part of taking away the humanity of a woman and uh, taking away what's considered to be her power over men, which is her sexuality. And I think that it dehumanizes women in a way that is incomparable to anything else, especially the face covering itself. I think that is, makes it very easy to feel violent towards them. It makes it very easy to you know, otherize them. And there are Muslim women, uh, liberal Muslim women, who have never been forced into the hijab um, or never forced in the way that, that many are forced. And they feel that, you know, they say it's their choice and they write on these feminist blogs and they say, um, this is my choice. And I resent that other people say that I am uh, disempowered when I feel very empowered uh, with the hijab. And what I would say to these women is that it's, it's entirely possible for an individual in any circumstance to feel empowered by, by anything, by any kind of clothing. But I want those women to recognize and advocate for the many, many women who don't have a choice in it at all. It isn't a choice. And they're not empowered by it. And I want them to advocate for those women and advocate for their choice. Armin Nababi or Mohammed Syed, anything to add? I, I have a story on, on this. Uh, when we were, when I was in Iran, uh, we, when I was in a class uh, with other students uh, for preparing for university entrance and exam, our teacher, our Islamic teacher, was actually going through verses and hadith and trying to explain to all the students that why are these not sexist and why Islam is such a, a pro-female religion, pro-woman uh, religion. And, um, and one of our classmates at that time, I mean, we weren't familiar much with issues between male and female and how misogynistic Islam is. So when, when the teacher was this explaining this, one, I remember one of the girls in the class just started, just started crying. And our teacher just went to her and tried to console her. She's like, I know, I know, it's okay. And she just kept on crying. And then I saw two other girls get like having a little bit of tears in their eyes. And, you know, I was confused. I was like, why are they so upset? The teacher is clearly explaining that these are not anti-female by any means. And, and, you know, now that, now that I think about it, that it's, it's very telling that you have to go through so much to explain why these verses and hadiths are not anti-female. I mean, nobody felt the need to explain why any verses are anti-male. So the fact that it takes an entire chapter and so much effort to explain to people why this is not anti-female kind of suggests that they, they probably are. The website of the Council on American Islamic Relations has a section dealing with, quote, Islamophobia. The Council on American Islamic Relations believes Islamophobia in the United States is a current manifestation of the issue of prejudice that has plagued our nation since its earliest days. That's as a quote. It's the same old hate, just with a relatively new target. Muslims, like Malcolm X, have been involved in historical U.S. movements combating prejudice. But only after the 9-11 terror attacks did they become a primary focus for purveyors of hate. With this in mind, CAIR is dedicated to countering prejudice in general. We recognize while Muslims are a primary focus of hate today, it will one day pass to another group. We continue to work to ensure 
social and legal protections for all Americans inspired by the sacrifices and ongoing struggles of African-American Muslims and Christians, as well as other minorities who've been marginalized, including Japanese Americans, Jews, Catholics, and others. Their definition, Islamophobia, a closed-minded prejudice against or hatred of Islam and Muslims. An Islamophobe is an individual who holds a closed-minded view of Islam and promotes prejudice against or hatred of Muslims. Islamophobia, there's a hot-button word. Anybody want to tackle it? What's the difference between criticizing Islam or Islamists and being an Islamophobe? So there's a deliberate attempt to merge the two because defending religion is more important than defending individuals. Defending human rights is a secondary thing. We were... At least growing up in Pakistan, I was never taught the importance of human rights over the importance of religion. Religion is primary, so of course that's what they're going to focus on. The fact that their name comes with American Islamic relations says it all. There are many apologists that talk about it in the same way, where criticism of Islam is immediately turned into criticism of Muslims. Um, There was a talk uh, two days ago with Sam Harris and Dino Bidella, where he accused Sam Harris of being a bigot. Sam Harris was talking about the problem with an Islamic scripture about gay people being killed, and as a result, he is a, a bigot towards the Muslim people. Um, that's, I think, very agenda-driven and very transparent. And many, many Muslims are engaged in that. And it may not be coming from the point of view of I, they want to obfuscate, but it's a natural idea that religion must be defended at all costs. Armin, is Islamophobe a way to call you a bigot so you won't criticize Islamic teachings? Yeah, it's funny how the statement that you just read mixes um people that hate Islam and discriminate against Muslims as if they're the same thing, as if, uh, you know, as if if you if you want to criticize an ideology, then you must discriminate against all the people that believe in it. Based on that standard, then the Quran itself is very Christian phobic and very Jewish phobic because the Quran itself criticizes Christian belief and Jewish belief. So would that would that mean that the Quran is a bigoted book? Would, would that mean that every Muslim that believes in the Quran is, a, is, is discriminating against Christians? I mean, and, I mean, as lo- Muslims have every right to criticize other ideologies, and they do all the time. They criticize Christianity, uh, they criticize Judaism, they criticize atheism, and they have every right to. They have every right to ridicule it. They have every right to say why it's wrong. Um, and nobody should accuse them as being bigoted if they do so, as long as they're not generalizing a large group of people and focusing on their ideology. So if they have the right to do that, why can't we come and say that these are the, the problems that we have with Islam and these are the things that we find questionable and not be, you know, I don't, I, I mean, Islamophobic it is, is, is a very, bad term because there is actual actual real discrimination against Muslims out there. But when you use the term Islamophobic, you're basically suggesting that you're mixing that real discrimination with, with a very harmless and legitimate criticism of the ideology. Maybe a better term would have been, I don't know, Muslimophobia. Uh, because, you know, Islam and Muslim is not the same thing. If you are against Islam, it doesn't mean that you are against all Muslims, right? We... we uh, me, me, Mohammed, and Sarah disc, uh, have voiced our opinion here and, and uh, elsewhere against anybody that discriminates against Muslims and will continue to do so. But at the same time, we should be able to preach to criticize Islam. And, you know, a lot of people on the, uh, a lot of liberal Westerners, they feel like they don't want to, crit- even though they agree with us, they don't want to criticize Islam because they think that they would get mixed in with the bigots that are actually anti-Muslim, not anti-Islam. But actually, that, that doesn't make sense, because if you don't criticize Islam in the right way without actually generalizing a whole group of people, you're making those bigots the only game in town. You're making them the only players. You have to provide the right method of criticizing Islam. You have to provide an alternative for people that do actually want to focus on the ideology rather than an, an entire group of people uh, to be able to compete with that. Sarah Hader, you have any thoughts on Islamophobia? Uh, I mean, I agree with a lot of what Armin said. I think he he said it very well in that uh, the term Islamophobia takes away from from the legitimacy of of, of the issue of anti-Muslim uh, bigotry, which which I, I agree with Armin in that it is a real harmful thing. It is happening. But when you merge it with criticism of the religion, you, on the one hand, take away legitimacy from that bigotry. And on the other, you sort of unfairly legitimize 
the religion and um, you protect it from harm. And it's something that in the end, I think, is harmful to Muslims. And I think a lot of this comes back to that. Like in the end, it is harmful to Muslims because there are reformers out there who want to be able to talk about parts of the religion they don't like. Even some of them who are still Muslims, there are ex-Muslims and Muslims that, are, uh, that want to talk about certain parts of the religion or the practice of the religion that they believe is harmful and harmful primarily to other Muslims. But because of the way that we talk about criticism, Islam, because of the way that uh, anti-Muslim bigotry and Islamophobia have been fused into one thing, this makes it practically impossible for anyone to be able to walk this line and not be accused of being anti-Muslim in some way, or not be accused of being an Uncle Tom or uh, a native informant or a house Arab. And these are terms that are thrown at us for disagreeing with certain tenets of the faith. And what what happens in the end is that everyone is silent, is that we can't talk about certain harmful aspects of the religion at all, even if it is in a sympathetic way, in a way that's sympathetic to Muslims. Uh, there is just silence. And who is that harm at the end? I think it really harms the Muslims, the minorities, the women that are the target of this religion. What would be, in your opinion, an example of legitimate, actual bigotry and discrimination against Muslims as opposed to against Islam as an ideology or religion? What would be something that would literally be wrong and we want to speak out against it? Well, I mean, I, I can come up with many hypothetical examples, but I can give you uh, one or two real ones that have happened to me. Um, even though I am a pretty outspoken ex-Muslim, uh, there have been times where um, I think my video was posted somewhere, I forget exactly on what forum, uh, but some sort of a very right-wing uh, forum, and my video was uh, an open, openly secular video where I was coming out as openly secular, and I was saying that I'm a humanist and I'm a free thinker. Um, and somebody commented on there; they, they said something like, the, "You know, once a Muslim, always a Muslim." And I've heard this type of thing in different forms that you know the stink of Islam can never be wiped off of you, or even um, as an ex-Muslim, if I say that I've said before, I criticize Christianity. And um, there have been some people that have seen me criticize Christianity and they have said, well, this is, uh, this is your, your Muslim upbringing. Uh, it's infected you and you haven't, this is the hangover from Islam and you haven't been able to wear off. And to me, that sounds like anti-Muslim bigotry. It makes it seem as if there is some sort of virus or infection that's in, within me that, that I, I can't even shake off, even though I have claimed myself to be an ex-Muslim. I'm going to move off of discrimination here in just a second, but... The word racist is bandied about in relation to Islam, as if Islam is a skin color or a race. This is a common thing, and does anyone want to address it? The thing is that people are looking at, due to a lack of knowledge, due to a lack of understanding as Muslims, as a race, even though they're not. So that's more on the person that is bigoted, and they're acting to racialize Muslims, even though they're not. And a lot of Muslims want to do that as well, because they want to create a group Muslim identity of a victim of a persecuted group, and it plays to them. So to a certain extent, they're yin and yang, and they're working in concert to prevent reform within Islam. When people silence um, dissent, when they silence the ability of people to criticize problems within any culture, any ideology, they prevent any progress from ever happening. If you couldn't criticize our American government, the ability of America to progress would go away immediately, and that is what had happened to Islam for many, many centuries. And groups like CARE and others that immediately cry racist to anybody talking about Islam propagate that. Mohammed Sayed, let me make sure I'm clear on this. You're saying that there are many Islamists who actually foster, who fuel the fires of the charge of racism because it allows them to paint opposition as being bigoted and racist. Yes, that's correct. They don't want criticism of religion, so any means that would shut down, down that criticism is valuable. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to, to what Mohammed was saying, was that I think that there is a, a cynical manipulation of of the protectiveness that the left that some on the left have towards what who they feel to be oppressed minorities by Muslims, they they can sense that that there are certain hot topics, which is to say uh, racism and bigotry, that that are something that the left wants to prevent, and so they they there is a I think a concentrated effort to merge racism and bigotry um, into criticism of religion and to sort of cynically manipulate and abuse um, those good intentions that some people have. 
I would like to add that if somebody is uh, saying that criticizing Islam is racist or any criticism of Islam uh, is verging on racism, I want to know who are the top 10 critics of Islam that are very in your face along the lines of Hitchens or Ingersoll and are regarded as being liberal and not bigoted. They don't exist because anybody that actually criticizes Islam and goes at it is immediately labeled a bigot. Talking here with Muhammad Syed, Sarah Hader, Armin Nababi. Finally, we're going to get into the ex-Muslim. There was an article in BBC News magazine just yesterday about two people whose real names were not used for the article, I don't think. They started to question Islam, question the Quran of all things, and rejected the hijab and decided they weren't Muslims. One girl was 14 when she said this, quote, My dad threatened to kill me by getting a knife and holding it against my neck and saying we might as well do it if you're going to bring this much shame to the family. She was repeatedly beaten, and after she reported him, her father, to the police, he was convicted in a British court of child cruelty. In an Iraqi court, a Saudi court, a Syrian court, the father might have been acquitted, perhaps even applauded, yes? Well, in Iran, uh, I don't know how how old you mentioned the girl was, but in Iran, uh, the girl would be in jail unless she took back her conversion. So if she didn't take back her conversion, she would be executed. But it's a question of honor, is it not? She has shamed the family and the religion of Islam. Is that the charge? From the family point of view, a lot of, uh, they might consider it a, sh- a shame, but from the government's point of view, it's mostly based on Islamic law. You left Islam, you need to be executed. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. I mean, a lot of government, Islamic governments don't follow that law, but I know Iran and Saudi Arabia do. Iran is more worried about international attention, a little bit more worried about international attention than Saudi Arabia, so a little bit pressure on Iran might convince them not to do so. In Pakistan, you might not have the government after you if you publicly leave Islam, but then you have mobs to deal with. Sometimes in Pakistan, you might be, you might prefer, or, or even Bangladesh, you might prefer to get arrested because at least in prison you're, you're safe. But aren't we presented with stories about family members, fathers, spouses doing violence upon another when they either challenge the authority of that male authority figure or they leave Islam? There seems to be a question of honor at play, correct? Before uh, getting on that, I wanted to add something to what Armin said about police custody. Um, There was a case in Pakistan where um, a sitting governor was assassinated by his bodyguard because of blasphemy. And... But the bodyguard was in jail, and somebody else was also in jail in a different cell for blasphemy. The bodyguard convinced his guard to go and kill the other person. Well, what's going on here? It's, it's that blasphemy is that much of a taboo? It's that evil that they can just convince people to go and be judge, jury, executioner on the spot? Well, and the existence of an ex-Muslim counters the belief of many Muslims. Muslims believe that most people are against Islam because they don't understand it. They they haven't tried it. As soon as anybody just reads the Quran or just becomes a Muslim, they just never go back. It's so beautiful. It's so inspiring that you can't even consider any, how could they even ever been a non-Muslim? That's, you know, that's what a lot of these people believe. And then when you have people that were Muslims for most of their life and leave, it's just such a shock and such a disgrace. And so, I mean, you know, and and an ex-Muslim is just offensive just by existing. You don't, if you're an ex-Muslim, you don't even have to say anything and you're already offensive. So an apostate is much, much worse than someone who just simply never believed in the first place. Yes, exactly. A lot of people that say bad things about Islam are just dismissed as ignorant, as misinformed. But then when you have somebody that has been a Muslim all their life, you either ignored it or you try to, you get very offended, you try to take action against it. Um, Or one thing that is um, common is that you accuse them of never, never have been Muslim. Um, That's very common on social media as well. When you tell people that you, you were a Muslim that, and now you're not, um, they say like, it's impossible for somebody to be Muslim and then leave Islam. So you you probably were never, never really Muslim. To add to the honor thing, um, A lot of communities are very closely knit, so stepping out of line has consequences. So a child may, say, leave religion and speak up about it, but then 
there may be social consequences to the parents, to the family, to siblings. Um, nobody would want to marry your sister. Your parents will be kicked out of the community. So there is a large uh, network social effect trying to minimize this and minimizing anybody speaking out against anything. So honor does play into that to a great extent. If your family is dishonored, nobody may want to have anything to do with you, and therefore you need to preserve the honor at all costs. Sarah Hader? Yeah, I mean, um, building onto that, I, I absolutely think that it's it's a form of oppression that starts from wider circles, from the community, and it gets pushed into the family units. I know of uh, many families who, who themselves are pretty liberal in the sense that, that the parents are pretty liberal or, you, you know, and they will sort of allow their children to have freedoms that otherwise they might not want them to have as Muslims. But because of community pressure, because of the pressure from the outside world, they, they're sort of forced to make their children act a certain way. Um, and that's in order that they themselves don't get shunned. And these effects are larger than just an individual. And I think a lot of that has to do with part of them being a part of this honor culture, something that we've sort of uh, moved away from in the West. And to add to your the, the earlier point that we were talking about with what Armin was mentioning, that just being an ex-Muslim is in itself very offensive and it is something that is that is more harmful that you can do maybe with maybe a christian can do if they're criticizing religion and i think that's absolutely the case and that's part of the reason that we chose to to name our organization ex-muslims of north america a lot of people have come up to us and they have said well why did you pick ex-muslim that's very that's very in your face you don't need to be like that you can just be you know some sort of a vague generic atheist name that that in somehow uh, speaks to your Muslim background, but it doesn't have to be ex-Muslim. Um, there were people that even recommended, and many people actually, that recommended that we change our name in order to be something that's more that's that's easier to digest for people. But the biggest reason that we stuck by it was that this is our form of protest. There are so many that that deny our very existence that say that it is it is impossible to be who we are. And we want to be proud of it, and we want to be upfront about it. And not just that we're atheists, because it's easy to dismiss somebody as just having always been an atheist, or having always been a disbeliever in some way, as Armin was mentioning, you were never really Muslim to begin with. We want to be upfront about the fact that we were once believers, and we have left. And we want to make that a, as a form of protest, that this is possible. So I'm in an oppressive radical Islamic culture, but I don't believe, and I'm looking for something, anything, and I find your website. If I participate, am I throwing my name and home address and personal details out in full living color in view of those who might show up and, at my door and you know, bring the, bring the hammer down upon me? Are there people who can participate in your community and the resources you provide anonymously if they need to? Yeah, so we require the information for our verification because we want to make sure that everybody's safe. But beyond that, everything is anonymous. Most people do not uh, need, we don't disclose anybody's information ever. And that's, I would say, our prime directive because we want to make sure that everybody is safe and everybody is secure and everybody's in control of their own information. And there are people over here that are part of our group that are on visas from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, from a lot of oppressive countries. And if their identities came out, it could be very, very bad for them. So we prize our um, security procedures above all else. Do you limit it to North America? Do you have people participating, you said, from all over the world? Uh, no, people that originate in all parts of the world. We are, are only in the U.S. and Canada. Is there a resource for somebody who is currently residing in Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq? For okay, if you are in North America, ex-Muslims of North America is a fantastic way to to find people in your area, and it's very the screening process is so um, advanced that um, and you know they, they do one-on-one -on -one interviews, and I've never uh, it's a very good way to get involved with other ex-Muslims. If you're not in North America, what Atheist Republic provides is a is an online forum where you could discuss things with other people because. Unfortunately, Facebook has had a strict policy of using real names, and that's uh, unfortunately very damaging to a lot of people that can't reveal their real name. So our forum on Atheist Republic has become very active, and that's a place where 
Uh, you don't even have to worry about us sharing your identity because you don't have to reveal your identity. If you open an account there, I suggest that you use an email that is not the same as the common email that you use, uh, just in case. But another thing that we provide on Atheist Republic is if you go to any page on Atheist Republic and you want to leave a voicemail to share your views with all our audience, and we have a large following. So um, we have an opportunity podcast that is coming up and what we're going to do is just play voicemails. So if you are in any place in, in Pakistan, Indonesia, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, if you're in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, please find the software that you could change your voice uh, just to be safe. Uh, but you can leave a voicemail and then we will broadcast that voicemail to all our followers. But um, it's hard for people in, in these countries to, I mean, there's a lot of um, groups already there uh, some people can believe that actually in Pakistan and Egypt and Saudi Arabia, there's actually atheist activists that have been involved in, in, the, in these kind of activism for a very long time, and they're very sophisticated, and they know how to, uh, you know, hide their identity. So try to find them, your local atheist activists. You, you might be surprised that they actually are there, no matter where you are. Just make sure that you become active for a while before they trust you enough to for you to be able to share more information with them. There, there are a lot of ways. Unfortunately, face-to-face -face meetups in a lot of places are almost impossible. But I do see that even though it's dangerous, a lot of people do still take the risk. And sometimes I see people in more free countries become judgmental of the risk-taking that these people take because they think it's not worth it and, you know, these, they could die. But at the same time, it's their choice. They know what the risks are. And I remind them that every right and every freedom that now we, we enjoy today in free countries is because somebody braver than us at one point took the risk to stand up and to say something, sometimes at great cost. And we owe everything to those people. A picture of vast sort of silent underground of people in these oppressed cultures where the powers that be are trying to limit information, but in the age of the Internet, you find people who are finding a way to get to the information they seek. They're watching videos, they're reading blogs, they're participating in forums. They are connecting to the rest of the world. To give you an example um, of exactly that, uh, there's a Somali journalist that um, is getting asylum in the U.S. right now, and he became an atheist after watching Richard Dawkins' uh, documentary, Virus of Fate. And... During that period, he was working with uh, interviewing Al-Shabaab, which is the major terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda equivalent in Somalia. And he was interviewing their head, their PR person, as an atheist. Obviously, he, there was no way he could ever come out. He wants a better future for his children. That's why after all of that went down, he uh, tried. he's in the process of moving to the U.S. and getting asylum. Um, there are lots and lots of people like that that would like to stand up, that would like to make a change, but it's too dangerous. Over time, as their ranks swell, I believe they will be able to actually enact that change. And going back to what you were saying about watching videos, um, I just today had a conversation with somebody from Pakistan, and he was very interested in science, and he was watching a video of a parasitic organism that infects ants, and ants go to the top of a blade of grass and are eaten by mammals and the whole life cycle. And he saw that video and was very intrigued by it, and he started watching other science videos, and eventually wound up on atheist videos, and he understood evolution. And in short order, he left religion. But by watching, by his interest in science, eventually led him to more and listen to more and more until he was an atheist. And he was saying he, to a certain extent, he regretted it because now he's a prisoner and he can't speak up about these issues and he's afraid and the social consequences of that. But simply by going online and engaging his curiosity, he understood and he changed his outlook on reality. Well, Mohammed, Sarah, Armin, I mean, how do we help these people? I don't want that to come off as sort of a, a platitude, an empty gesture of, well, what can we do, you know? But, but if we genuinely wanted to help facilitate an escape for some of these people, to help change the temperature of the conversation, to make it easier in 20 years than it is today, what can we do? One of the things okay. that we need to do is we need to have these honest conversations over here where we can criticize Islam where we can talk about these issues when we, where we can blaspheme or we can ridicule. And we need to realize that when people try to shut down this conversation, even many people in the West, even Americans, even Canadians and British people try to shut down this conversation coming from a point of paternalistic, uh, I want to save the poor brown person. 
And to me, that is bigoted. And that is basically condemning uh, Muslims from never, ever reforming. And they are culpable for that. And we need to shut that down where conversations, these conversations can happen here. And that empowers other people in other countries. When we started Exclusive in North America, we got many people that messaged us and wanted to ask how we're doing things, and they wanted to replicate it. We got a message from Tunisia, from a bunch of different countries. Um, there's a group that started up in Australia after that. We shared how we run things over there. Um, so these things will happen organically, I think. We need to help them by providing them support and being unflinching in our resolve to criticize religion, to be champions of free speech. Do you support blasphemy? Do you support, like, Draw Muhammad Day and those types of things? Personally, absolutely, I think. That, that, that's the sort of thing, the risk-taking, the daring thing, that's exactly what needs to happen. Um, echoing off of what, what Armin was saying earlier, that it is these sort of things that people look down on and they say, well, this is just foolish. And a lot of people said this with the Charlie Hebdo cartoons. They said that uh, it, it was foolish what they were doing, and therefore they should not have done it. But it is the actions of radicals that change the temperature of, of the conversation, that change the way we think. And it is the radicals that empower the moderates to speak up, even if it is only to say, well, that guy's crazy. I'm not as extreme as him, but maybe we should think about giving women more rights, or maybe we should have these conversations about how we treat apostates. And they can even point to us to say that, that, that that's extreme, but let's move the conversation a little bit in his direction. It's a little bit easier to do that when there is somebody that, that's speaking up and when there is somebody that's taking that, that risk, and it is a risk. And, and the Bangladeshi bloggers, for example, um, they are absolutely taking a heavy risk. They, they are. And I don't think that... It's something that can be expected of everyone, but those that are doing it need to be empowered however we can empower them. If that means giving them financial resources or structural resources or the option to come and have shelter and safety here, whatever we can do, we need to do it because those are the people that will change the dialogue. I'm frustrated that we're always having this conversation about waiting for the moderates, to, the, the moderate Muslims, where are they? Well, the way that the atmosphere right now, it's very hard for the average Muslim, the moderate Muslim to speak up. And it's not in the nature of the moderate to take a risk to stand in the, in the face of gunfire and speak out anyway. So we need to empower these radicals who are doing it anyway. And people like Majid Nawaz, for example, who have been you know, called all sorts of names for even asking for a reform Islam. And he is a Muslim, but he gets attacked as... Uh, you know, all sorts of things anyway. And those are the type of people that we need to be empowering. Armin, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, to the point that Sarah was making, it's, uh, it's very interesting to see that drawing these cartoons actually has informed a lot of non-Muslims and Muslims as well. It has brought a lot of attention to the issue of free speech, to, the, to its limitations or lack thereof. And uh, everybody is like, uh, that you didn't used to a lot of people that didn't used to even think about these issues are now are much more informed from both sides of this argument about uh, you know what where their lines uh, are or what they believe i even talked to a lot of muslims and i noticed that uh, in the past few years their position has shifted from the anybody that draws muhammad is a criminal act and this sh it should be stopped their position has slowly, some of them at least, has changed to it's still a disgusting thing to do, uh, but, I, uh, but it's not something that, you know, should be enforced. And I guess, like, if it's not their religion, nobody should force them to, stop, uh, to not draw it, but they're still disgusting and horrible people for doing it. So, I mean, they, they shift their position because of maybe noticing all the discussion and being more familiar with the fact that it's very ridiculous to exp expect somebody that is not a member of your religion to follow the rules of your religion. And these, and these shifts in opinions only happen when we uh, highlight them. And, you know, you could write uh, books and articles and a lot of people will just not read them. But when you, when you have campaigns like Draw Muhammad Day, uh, and these are things that will get more attention and a lot of people will make a lot of people start thinking about them. Another thing with regards to how to reach out to people, just providing them a, with a platform, getting them to call into podcasts, like giving people from around the world an option, a, a way to express themselves and talking about the, the issue 
just like this podcast. I mean, I, I've noticed that the ex-Muslim issue is becoming more common topic in a lot of different podcasts and a lot of different atheist blog posts. And even, as you mentioned, on like BBC. So just bringing more attention to this topic is going to help a lot. One thing when I noticed when I was a Muslim and when I left Islam, I felt like I was the only one. And I, and I didn't, um, I was very uncomfortable expressing my view to anybody but when I did eventually do that, the first two two of my friends that I talked to them about them, they became atheists within within a few weeks, uh, which was very shocking to me. And and I do think in a lot of Islamic countries, the only reason why people are not atheists is because they've never really even considered the alternative. I mean, in, in Europe or United or North America or Australia, I think a lot of people that are religious at least are familiar with atheism. That so we might have. Uh, hit um, you know a roof or something when it comes to increasing the percentage but i think in a lot of islamic country, there's, uh, countries there's a lot more potential or even religious christian countries like the philippines for example uh, i think a lot of people there are naturally skeptic or and educated or free thinkers and and they will gladly consider the atheism option as soon as they it's provided to them as an alternative mohammed sayed sarah hader and Armin Navabi, I want to give each one of you kind of a final word if you want to give an encouragement to the ex-Muslim or sort of put a cap on what your website does or anything else that's on your mind. The websites are for the ex-Muslims of North America. It's exmna.org and, of course, atheistrepublic.com. I will include links to both of those websites in the description box of this podcast so you can access it Easily. I guess I'll start with you, Muhammad. Any final words for the broadcast tonight regarding the ex Muslim or Islam in general? For ex Muslims listening, know that you're not alone, that there are many, many people in every single part of the world that are organizing and that are reaching out to other people, and you can do the same. For those in the West that want to silence criticism of Islam, be they um, people from the West, be they Muslims, you need to stop doing this because you're harming people. You're harming the future of humanity. You're harming the future of a billion and a half people. We need to be able to criticize. We need to be able to reform. Armin Navabi, any final words? Yeah, I just want to go back to how to re- how, what can we do to help people. If if you are um, an ex-Muslim in anywhere in the world that, that wants to leave a suggestion or li- leave your own personal story, I just want to just recommend again that you go to atheistrepublic.com and uh, there's a green button on almost every page. Uh, if you click it, just leave us a voicemail. Also, if you're not an ex-Muslim, but you have a message for ex-Muslims around the world that might be listening to our upcoming podcast, if you want to give them a message of support or encouragement. For a lot of these ex-Muslims, they sometimes feel um, very alone. They feel forgotten. Um, so a message of encouragement uh, might not seem much to us, but I mean, when I remember when I was an ex-Muslim in Iran, um, something like that would have meant a lot to me. And finally, Sarah Hader, any last thoughts? I mean, just to piggyback a little bit on what Muhammad has said and what Armin has said, um, you know, please speak out. If you are an ex-Muslim that you are listening, you know, know that you are not alone. Everyone thinks that they're alone. Um, I certainly thought I was. Get your voice out there. Talk about it. Engage with it. Join your local atheist group, or if it's just a website that you can access. If it's only that, then that is something. Um, and that know that you are a part of a movement and mo- a part of something that is changing. I would like to say to to non ex Muslims that are that may be listening in that please be conscious of of the specific struggles that we face. And something that bothers me that has always that has always bothered me is that sometimes people do not hold the same standard of life that they that they are used to. They believe that Muslims can live somewhere below that and still be happy. And this is sort of part of the feminist dialogue. A lot of times a lot of people say that, you know, Muslim women can be happy in this way, um, in a way that, that Western women cannot. Maybe FGM is acceptable in their culture and so it's okay. But I want to say that I want everyone to hold Muslims or anyone from any background to the same human rights standard and to have and to hold these universal standards of civil liberties and of human rights and extend them towards people of any culture. The website's again, exmna.org and atheistrepublic.com. 
Com. Mohammed Sayed, Sarah Hader, Armin Navabi, thank you so much for being a great panel for your input and most importantly for the wonderful and important work you are doing to help people who really do need you. We'll try to send some support to your direction, but thanks for being a part of the broadcast tonight. It means a lot. Thank you for having us. Our broadcast tonight brought to you by audible.com. More than 180,000 audiobooks and spoken word audio products. And right now, your free audiobook awaits with your 30-day trial at audiblepodcast.com slash thinkingatheist. And I will see you next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. Watch dozens of original videos on The Thinking Atheist YouTube channel. And visit our website for resources, links, contact information, the editor's blog, and more. TheThinkingAtheist.com